they worship with, uh, with me and with the whole Lakeshore congregation. So glad to have you. My friends, he is risen. He is risen indeed. I want to welcome uh, all those uh, who are visiting with us today. We're so glad to have you. For those who are online, we thank you for being here. Happy Easter to you as well. Let us know where you are worshiping from this morning, and happy Easter to you. Uh, we're going to start by standing, and the uh, band's going to lead us in a couple songs. Let's worship God together.
His promises are true and His strength. There is nothing we can do. Yes, we know. There are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave. The same power that commands the dead to wait lives in us. Lives in us. The same. everybody we have oh I'm sorry we have a treat for you right now we're going to have our children's choir come up and sing the song friend of god so come on up children's choir Jackson if you want to come up with us that's cool
Thank you. Thank you. Well done. I want to invite the rest of the kids who are here to come on down and to join me up here. As you uh, come down, I want you to grab an uh, egg from Pastor Brendan. But the thing I need you to do is not open it. No matter what you do, do not open that egg yet. Uh, we're going to open them together. But everyone who comes down gets, gets an egg. All right, we're going to find out in just a, just a moment, in just a second. And once you grab an egg, come down and, and sit down uh, here. We'll be, we'll be here together. Uh, yeah, come, come on down. Yeah. You already know that. You already know about the, the eggs. Yeah, grab, grab an egg. Grab an egg and, and then come and sit down. Don't open it. Don't open it. Whatever you do, don't open it. No, don't open it. Okay, okay, everybody got one? Everyone got one? Okay, on the count of three, we're gonna open them together. Ready, one, two, three! <laughs> they're empty. Well, uh, don't worry, there, there is gonna be, we're, they're empty. Was, it, was that a surprise? You get an empty uh, Easter egg. You know, one of the things that we are doing today is celebrating the greatest surprise there ever was. When some women went to see Jesus, who had done some surprising things already, they, they were going to the tomb, and when they got there, even though Jesus had already died, he wasn't there. It's because he was alive. And that was the most surprising thing that has happened in all of history. You guys like surprises? Yes. I love surprises. I remember when I did a surprise party for my uh, dad's uh, 75th birthday. And we just had such a good time. He was so surprised uh, that I was there. One of the surprises that we learn on Easter when we learn that Jesus is alive is that Nothing can stop us from being a friend in, of God. And that's why I was so grateful for our children's choir who was singing to us, I am a friend of God. Do you guys, yeah? I remember last year when we got eggs, and they were just empty packs of gum. Just empty packs of gum, yeah. Now we got empty eggs. So uh, there, there's, there's, a, there's a theme here. It's, it's the empty tomb. But you guys know why I have the goggles on? Because today we are also announcing that because of Jesus and his resurrection, the fact that we can be friends with him, that we can now dive into friendship with God. And that's the theme of our Vacation Bible School this summer, which we're, we're announcing is the, for the first week of August. And we invite you all to be a part of that. Diving in? Anybody like to dive in? Search for treasures? Find friends? that we're gonna do that this summer. So I gave you an empty egg, and this is now your egg to keep. And it's a reminder to you that the best news of this day is the surprise of the empty tomb. And you're gonna be able to collect that along with the, all the other eggs that you're gonna collect that are gonna be part of your Easter egg hunt. And I understand that those eggs that you guys will be collecting are not empty. All right, that they're filled with lots of good prizes. But hold on to this egg because this is the best thing that we could ever get on Easter the news and the surprise that the tomb is empty and that Jesus is alive. I know. Will you pray? You guys want to pray with me? Let's pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for the surprise of the empty tomb. And we ask that you help us to spread the news of this surprise. Amen. Okay, are you guys ready for Easter eggs? More of them? Okay. Yeah, and uh, if you, the, it's going to happen real quick, but the Easter egg hunt is outside. So if you have a coat or something like that, you can grab that. If not, it's, if not, it's going to be real quick. You guys are going to find them quick. Before you head out, before you head out, for those of you who aren't with us every week, we do a blessing. All right, we do a blessing where the church blesses all of you and you can bless uh, the church again. Yeah, some people are getting coats. Oh, you don't want to keep it? Okay, that's fine. All right, church, you're going to have to help me here. Will you offer a blessing? May the love of Jesus Christ be with you. 
And you all say, and also with you. It's too exciting. We, we, you guys are off. You're off. I love your coat. That's wonderful. of the announcements about the summer's program. We invite you to help us spread the news about what's happening here to your grandkids, to your kids, to your neighbors, to your coworkers. The events that we're holding uh, for, for kids are open to, to everyone, and we want to ask you to help us uh, spread the news as we announce the dates uh, this morning. We are celebrating the greatest surprise that has ever come into human history, the surprise of the resurrection today, and we're, again, glad that each and every one of you are here, especially if you're visiting with us. Thanks for being here. We're going to continue in the spirit of worship. I invite you to stand as we uh, sing together.
Let's praise together. The splendor of a king, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. soul is full. How great is our God on this Easter Sunday. Now I'm going to read some scripture for you. Um, if you look on our screens, you can uh, follow along. Um, a reading from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Listen for God's word. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, 
The women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. He's risen indeed. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to be like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself, what had happened? Jesus is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. where there is buried deep beneath the ground a treasure, a treasure that is worth more than any other treasure that's ever been found. Oh, really, I said? I said, how do you know about it? Well, Daddy, you open up the secret door in my room and you travel down a staircase and when you get to the bottom of it, you'll see it. The treasure is right there. And I said, if the treasure is right there, why don't you bring it back to us? I said, Daddy, there's a real live dragon guarding the treasure. I look at him, and he just says, for real life, Daddy. (laughs) When imaginative young kids are telling stories, it's really cute. But if my wife was trying to pass that one off on me, I'd just be waving our, honey, that nonsense, come on now. I got an Easter sermon to prepare this week. And if she doubled down with a real live dragon, I might think that she might need some professional help, (laughs) if you know what I mean. The Easter story is one of those fantastical stories that a kid might tell. Daddy, I was taking flowers to Jesus' grave. And when I got there, the, the stone was rolled away and I peered inside and his body was gone. Now, oh, come on, buddy, those kind of stones, they don't move around. Daddy, it was a, a miracle. Uh, two angels stood before me. They were white and dazzling like lightning. And they told me that Jesus is alive. Daddy, he is risen. <laughs> Except... It's not an imaginative little kid who is telling this story. It is a bunch of women, not just one woman, but but a large cadre of women who all went and saw the same thing, experienced the same thing, and then came back and they all had the same story. But the disciples who were hearing it were just waving it off. Come on, that's nonsense. That's crazy talk. It, these disciples, they didn't have an inkling of faith. They didn't even have enough doubt to like engage the women and to question the women. They're just dismissing what these women are saying. But the thing is, this story, it's not a fairy tale. It is the story that tells the profound truth of Easter, and it is for real life. There was one disciple who was a little bit different upon hearing the news. His name was Peter. Peter, the one who had uh, hosted Jesus before Jesus even began calling disciples. Peter, the one of the first disciples that Jesus called, he left everything, his fishing business, and went and followed Jesus. And then he saw Jesus perform the miracles, cast out demons. He experiences Jesus' rescue as Jesus grabs him up out of 
of the lake as he is drowning. This Peter is the one who Jesus said, you are the rock and on you I'm gonna build my church. This is the same Peter who just three days earlier had said to Jesus, I will follow you no matter what, but then just hours later denies Jesus three times, denies even knowing him. That was the last moment that he saw Jesus, but he knew the rest of the story. Jesus was arrested, crucified, killed, dead and buried. That was the story of Jesus' life. And we don't know why, but after the women tell the story, he alone gets up and runs to the tomb. Well, why does he get up? Is this a, a momentary restoration of faith that gets him to go, or has he just got enough doubt to want to go and see? Is he curious, confused? He just needs to check out the women's story. Whatever it is, it's some form of hope that gets him to get up and to go. And when it gets to the tomb, he peers into the tomb and he sees these burial cloths lying there. There's no body of Jesus. And our story reads that he walks away wondering about what had happened. Wonder. Wonder actually shows up twice in this Easter story. Once in the beginning and once in the end. Once with the women and once with Peter. In the beginning with the women, it's them looking in the empty tomb, seeing that Jesus' body is gone, and then wondering about what had happened, as in being confused, perplexed, literally at a loss and without a way. That's how you would translate the Greek. When Peter wonders, it's actually a completely different word in the original language. It's, it, it's the word for wonder that we use when we're like wonder and awe. Peter is amazed. And I wonder if wonder is not the first step, in, in all of its forms, in all of its English forms, it's not the first step in realizing the true meaning of Easter. Because the women wondered and Peter wondered. The other disciples, they didn't wonder. The Greek word for how they received the news of the women is nonsense. And that word literally translated means garbage, meaning that these men want to throw out the women's story with the trash. And that is really a very natural human response when we get bombarded with news that just doesn't fit any of our conceptions or understanding of the world, we just dismiss it, we just wave it off, we say that it's nonsense, we don't want to even waste our time traveling down that road. And I understand why the disciples don't want to waste their time traveling or entertaining such a ridiculous story because, because they knew the this, this, this story. Jesus was dead and they were in grief and they didn't want to go back. You see, they knew how the world is. And if the resurrection really was true, if Jesus really is alive, that means that the world that they know no longer exists. The, the world that they know, the world where you are born and you live and you die, and that's the end, that's no longer the world for real life. I was talking to a grocery store clerk uh, earlier this week and he was just lamenting out loud. He said, man, I gotta work on Easter. And I said, oh man, I'm so sorry I have to work on Easter. He pulled the morning shift. He's working right now. He started at 6.30 a.m. And I said, I'm sorry, you have to work right in the middle of church too. And he said, I know, right? And I asked him, I said, is church something that you do? He said, no. He said, you know, I grew up going to church, but I've grown out of it. By which he means that he's grown out of the nonsensical stories that the church tells about Jesus. And I said, that's so interesting because I've grown into it. 
by which I mean I've grown into to full belief that uh, Jesus came from heaven, was born, he lived his life as the Son of God, and he died, and he was buried, and then on the third day he rose again. And I believe that because he rose again, this is now how we should view all of human history, that this one event is now how we can interpret all of the world which means that the world is just more glorious, more divine, more wonderful, more even beyond our imaginations than we ever dreamed. I believe that we need to interpret Easter morning Use Easter morning to interpret all of the rest of the world. Rebecca Gurney uh, describes this as a metaphor, the empty tomb on Easter Sunday as this big black hole. This big black hole that <laughs> sucks all of creation into it, only then for it to emerge again on the other side. Uh, emerge not as it was, not even just incrementally better than it was, not like a second chance at the same thing, but emerge on the other side into the full, uh, its full glory, the glory of God. And, and as she uh, describes this, it makes me realize that on Easter, we're wondering about this thing that happened, but that also leads us to have to wonder about the God who made that happen. Because that cannot happen by any human means. This is not some incremental improvement or change in the scope of his, human history. This is God who has broken into the world and, and changed the world totally and completely. The world that we thought we knew no longer exists. And if that is the case, it means that God has triumphed. God has triumphed, and he has triumphed not uh, through uh, coercion or military triumph or through a, 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 a great argument. He has triumphed by doing what God has always done. He has given his, his life-giving and self-sacrificing creative power into the world. In order to reveal to us through Jesus Christ that the world is not, you're born, you live and you die, but the world is, you're born, you live, and you die, and then you live again. Jesus has lived this story, and he has come back to tell us that it's not just his story, but it's our story too, and actually, it is the story of the whole world, and as we think about that, we have to think about the God who has created this story, this world as it is for real life. I was talking to a young gentleman this, uh, not too long ago, and he was in my office, a young man of faith, and he was saying how hard it is for him to talk about and describe uh, you know, this God to his coworkers, because he says you know, his coworkers are all about his age, young, young men, and he says they don't have faith, they don't ever really been to church or any of that. It's, it, it's not that they don't have faith, it's that they don't even have these questions. It's, not, it's that they don't even doubt, and I don't even know how to begin to talk to them, you know, about a God up there who's looking down on us and who's controlling the world. I mean, that just, that doesn't make sense to, to them, and truthfully, pastor, it's a little bit crazy, and I don't know how to talk to them about that. This. And he said, don't get me wrong, I believe, but it is a little bit nonsensical. And I said, yeah, 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 I, I see your point. <laughs> I mean, how are we supposed to talk to secular people in our world today about what happened on Easter morning and about the God who made it happen? I mean, how do we even describe this God? Well, I can tell you how uh, people of God decided to describe this God 
uh, back 400 years ago. Back 400 years ago, the English Parliament called together what they called the Westminster Committee, and this was happening during the time of the Reformation of the Church in England. They came together to kind of try to figure out and to decide who, who is God uh, as we know him in, in our emerging understanding here in the middle of this Reformation. And they gathered all sorts of you know, academic types and theologians and pastors, and they got together to ask these questions about who God is and, and to create a, a way for young kids and for uh, new converts to be able to learn and to articulate about this God. And in the middle of these deliberations, they're all talking with uh, one another, a particularly onery member of the crowd uh, just kind of spoke up and said, what is God. And they're all looking at him. And they were just, you know, they were getting talking about in the clouds about what God is and who this is. And then this gentleman asks this impertinent question and it pulls him out of their conversation and everybody falls silent. He was basically asking them, what are we talking about anyway? <laughs> you know, what is God? Like, a very basic question. And no one quite knew how to answer it. And the answer got pinned on actually a gentleman by the name of George Gillespie. He was a a pastor in the boondocks out in the nowhere Scotland. And he was actually the youngest member of the committee, barely yet age 30. And as all eyes were on him and he was like forced to offer an answer to this kind of crazy question. So I need the wisdom of God to answer this. And so will you all join me in prayer? And then he prays this prayer that you see on the screen. He says, oh God, thou art spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. In thy being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And as he's praying, one of the gentlemen kind of poke open his eyes and, oh, this is pretty good. And he pulls out his pen and paper. He starts jotting this down. And this actually becomes the foundation for then how the, the committee describes who God is and what we know today as the Westminster Confession, one of the foundational documents that we continue to look at in the church. But while that worked for them, it's hard for me to imagine that you know, in our world today, if you go to uh, your workplace and you're talking to a secular person and, and you're trying to testify about your faith and who God is anyway, uh, that you would give the answer that they come up with. It's hard for me to imagine that even God himself, if you ask God, God, who are you, that God w would give the answer that comes out of the Westminster Confession. I want to put that one up because this is what they said. You know, this would be God saying, I am the one only living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own own glory. Oh no, they didn't stop there. A most loving and gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and with all most just and terrible in his judgment, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. <sighs> okay. But don't give that answer to your friends at work. <laughs> when Moses asked God who he was, God was there in a burning bush. And God, if he had answered in the way that the Westminster divines had answered, it's hard to imagine that there would have ever been an exodus. God responds to Moses' question, God, who are you? He says, it most mysteriously and simply, I am who I am. You know, I will be who I will be. It was God's way of saying, you know, I don't want you to try to comprehend me up here in your mind. I want you to know who I am by what I do. 
I am. Those are verbs. I am who I am. Those are verbs. God wants us to know him through his action. And so Moses came to know the God who brought Israel out of slavery. Now when Jesus and Peter are together, Jesus asks Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter announces, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and Jesus says, you're right, you got it right. And the way that Jesus knew this was because he saw in Jesus he saw him do only things that God can do. And through God's power, he got to see the God who is in Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus perform the healings and do the miracles and cast out demons. And he saw Jesus rescue him as he pulled him out of the lake. By the way, when Jesus did that, he was walking on water. No human can do that. God can do that. He saw God. You are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And yet we know that even as he articulated this correctly, he didn't fully understand who God was because he didn't yet have enough of an imagination. Because after he said this, Jesus began talking about his suffering and his death and his persecution. He was also talking about his new life after that, but he couldn't hear any of that because he said, no, 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 God can't die, suffer, God. But he was confining his conception of God to the world that he knew. This world where you're born and you live and you die and that's the end of the story. But Jesus was there to show him that the true nature of the universe and the very fabric of this world is not that story, but rather it is the story where you live, where you're born and you live and you die and you live again in the fullness of God's glory. And Jesus came to show us this story. He's lived the whole story and has come back to tell us, yes, that's your story too. That's my story. That's our story. In fact, this is the story of of the whole world. And we are now called to live in this world as ones who are able to witness and proclaim this world in a world that is perceived to be a world of death. But this is for real life. And so as we're thinking about God, we probably would do well not to think about God as you know, this incomprehensible being up there. I mean, we could have all of those debates, but, you know, when theologians and academics and pastors got together, get together, we can get our heads in the clouds. And that's why, you know, as Presbyterians, we let the people uh, be our government, uh, hear the word of God. And, and we would do well to say that, that God is whoever brought Jesus back from the dead. Who having brought Israel back and out of slavery before that. Who before that was the one who brought light out of darkness? Because in the very beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God began his work of creating and then redeeming and restoring his original plan for all of creation, which we now see through the resurrection and lens of Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you doubt all this, <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> Actually, it's good if you doubt. It's good to begin to wonder about this event and about this God who brought it about 
Just wonder, but just suspend your disbelief for a minute and, and just wonder upon the question, well, what if? What if it actually is true? Because wonder is how it began for the women and wonder is how it began for Peter. And if you say, oh, it's nonsense, it's just crazy, I can't even entertain it. Well, that actually, okay, too, because that was the story of the other disciples on Easter morning, but Easter morning is not actually the end of the story because uh, the day continues on. Then the other disciples heard the women's testimony and they then got Peter's testimony and then there were two other disciples that uh, met Jesus and it was a different thing and, uh, and they had their testimony and by the time they're hearing all of this, they begin to wonder just enough that suddenly Jesus actually appears in their midst and he says to them, peace be with you and do not be afraid for see I have overcome the world as you know it. Look and see here, this is the world that actually is for real life. Ukrainian pastor Ivan Rusin was the president of the Evangelical Theological Seminary in Kiev. And a couple of years ago when Russia invaded, just a couple of days after the Russian invasion, he, he closed the seminary, shuttered it. But he and his colleagues decided that they were going to stay and to minister to the people, to his people, to the Ukrainian people. He said, at first I kind of wanted to run, to, to flee away from the pain and the suffering and death. And he could have, because he could have gotten an appointment here in America easily. Uh, but he said he stayed because as he was thinking about it, he was thinking about Jesus, who had the cross in front of him and continued on. And he said, in order to be the church, I, I really have to be among the people even in the midst of the suffering, the pain, the violence, and the war. And, and so he's been there for 600 consecutive days. He was there and he w was you know, evading Russian soldiers and he, he, he actually even had to evade Ukrainian soldiers because there were checkpoints and they wouldn't let him go behind the checkpoints because it wasn't safe. But he said, I gotta, I gotta go behind because there's Ukrainian civilians behind enemy lines and, and he did that. But he's seen some horrific things. He's seen great suffering and death and pain. He's seen the soldiers shot and killed on both sides. He's seen innocent Ukrainian civilians uh, killed in, in cold blood. He's seen a Ukrainian soldier point a weapon at a five-year-old girl and he describes the trauma that she experienced and how she's now gonna have to live with this trauma for the rest of her life. In the beginning, he was asking these questions, where is God in the middle of all of this and God, how could you let this happen? But he said he didn't hold those questions for very long and it wasn't because God answered those questions but it because it gave way to a different question, the question like where is our humanity as a civilization that we as human beings could do this one to another? But he stayed in the midst of the pain, suffering, and death because he was challenged by Jesus who saw the cross ahead of him. And he asks these questions for himself every day almost, saying, am I going to survive this? Is my family going to survive this? And he says, in truth, I have no idea but it's in the midst of this reality, the reality of death, that uh, I have found myself closer to God than ever before, more certain of my faith than ever before, and so I stay. And even in the midst of this, he says, and I hope. He says, there will be a day when this war ends, and for there to be a, a, a new Ukrainian nation, a nation that comes back to life, to, to new life, the church is gonna have to be there because there's no way to rebuild a society without, after going through this without the gifts that the church uh, in Jesus Christ has to offer, the gifts of healing, 
the gifts of forgiveness and even possibly reconciliation. He said, I can't imagine how Ukraine could have any future without the church. And, and if I want to be the church for my people in that day, I have to be the church for my people here in this day. And so I, I stay. And uh, the pastor, through his witness, more than his words, has embodied the fullness of the truth of the resurrection story and the God who made it possible. You're born, you live, you die. It's not the end. There is new life. And there is a new world that is coming because of that, which we've already seen in the person of Jesus. Uh, my friends, uh, uh, Christians who hold on to Easter faith, they may just hold on to that refrain, and I hope. In the midst of peering at the cross and seeing its utter helplessness, a, a, a warning to all those who might go down that path, Miraculously, you find yourself filled with a desperate hope. A desperate hope that, that, that says, you know, even in the midst of, of the pain, the suffering, the death, I still hope. My friends, here on this Easter morning, I invite you to find yourself at the tomb and to hear the angel's words, why do you look for the living among the dead? Remember Jesus. Which means that at every ending and at every sealed tomb, at every cross, as a Christian, you can say, I know, and I hope. For what we see in front of us is not the entirety of the story. God has created a world that is bigger than we ever dared to hope or imagine. And this world we now see through the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. My friends, this is no fairy tale. This story is for real life. And when you begin living it, you have found the greatest treasure there is. Uh, we're 
about to come into a time where we're able to share it through the giving of ourselves and uh, the gifts that we have brought. One of the things that you've brought is your very self, and uh, if you got a yellow card, we invite everyone here just to let us know you've been here. These are our Connect cards. You can also uh, let us know you've been here by registering through the Lakeshore Church app. Did you know we have an app? You can download that uh, and or through the QR code uh, that will be displayed on the uh, screen at some point here during the offering uh, or on the back of the card. Uh, my friends, uh, in addition to uh, offering ourselves and our presence here today, if you have a prayer concern or request, you can share that with us. That's simply by putting the blue uh, card, uh, uh, the prayer on the blue card that you can find in the pew rack that can be a joy or a concern. We also give thanks and dedicate uh, the, financial, the gifts that come in through the financial supporters of the church. Uh, last week, we dedicated our One Great Hour sharing offering. That's a denominational offering. We'll continue to collect that today in addition to uh, our regular uh, offering to the Lakeshore Church. Last week, I talked about how it was actually through the denominational offering that we received a grant to transform our basement into a mission host site. And we host, we've been now for almost 10 years, hosting out-of-state mission teams. And uh, one of the places that out-of-state mission teams go to when they stay with us is our partner of the Second Mile Center of Detroit. Formed in 2007, we are one of three churches, three main churches that uh, are the primary mission partners of the Second Mile Center. It's just on the other side of our, our town line in the city of Detroit in one of the most challenged neighborhoods. It gives uh, ministry and hope to the kids of that neighborhood, and it's become a, a greater community hub. We volunteer there. We bring meals there. They've come here. Their director, Ruth Azar, has, has preached uh, for us. Uh, when you, when uh, you see the ministry there, you can see the transformation happening in that neighborhood. But I want to tell you a story about all of these partners coming together. Uh, a number of years ago, there was a mission team that came from Dalton, Massachusetts, and they stayed with us, and they served at the Second Mile Center. And there was one gentleman, a, an older teenager, who just caught the fire of Christ because of his week here in Metro Detroit, specifically with the Second Mile Center. He went home, and he told all of his friends, about Jesus and about the Second Mile Center. They came back the next year and the admission team was about twice the size because of this, uh, this young man's work. And they left and it wasn't too after they left that the story becomes very tragic because he suddenly died. In his early 20s, he, he, he died. And their church was without a pastor at the time. They were in transition. Or who is going to officiate this funeral? And they thought of Pastor Ruth Azar, and she ended up traveling 700 miles to officiate that funeral. And she uh, tells the story about how this kid's life was all about these weeks, completely transformed these weeks here in Metro Detroit, that he was an ambassador for the Lord there, and there were 700 plus people at this funeral, and that's what they were talking about. And people came to faith because of him, and then not only in his life, but also in his death. My friends, the the, the peace we had in that story is small, but the giving that you offer to this church uh, multiplies through the ministry of our partners. When you give to this church, you're also giving to the Second Mile Center. We're uh, regularly supporting them. We send checks to them every month. So I invite you to, to, to be a part of that impact, to be a part of this story this morning. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we do give you thanks for the tremendous and powerful ways that, that you are bringing uh, the vision for the world that is, the world that is for, for real life that we see through the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. And Lord, we're grateful that you want to use us as partners to, to proclaim this story. Lord, bless now the gifts that we uh, are bringing here today for your work in this world. Help this news to spread, Lord. It is good news. It is shocking news. It is not sensible until we understand the actual world that we're living in. So help us to embrace the wholeness of who you are this morning as we give our lives to you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus 
drink from the well Jesus is calling Oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood to stand and sing together. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought Stay standing here as I just uh, share these uh, prayers. Uh, we want to pray for the aunt of Brooke Beebe, who's a coworker. Uh, I can't read this writing, but someone in the room, I presume. Uh, she is in need of healing. We lift up prayers for this woman. We pray for Brooke Dunning, who was in a snowboarding accident and suffered spine damage. We pray that she gets feeling back. She'll be able to walk again. We give thanks here for Jesus, for doing what God sent him to do. And my hope is that we may all to fulfill our divine purposes, that glory may be to God. We want to continue our prayers for the health of strength of Janice Alls a member of our church. We also share this joy of a new uh, grandson who's due in August. That's for uh, Jackie and Dennis uh, Borkowski. We celebrate that with you today. We also celebrate the flowers that are here. Uh, Nisha Van Gorder gives them in dedication to those who are in this life with Jesus, uh, to God's glory. And we also dedicate the flowers uh, to Matthew Sabo. It was a year ago that... Uh, 
Matthew Sabo, a young man in his 20s, tragically and suddenly died. And we got a call during Holy Week from his parents. And, and we did a funeral during Holy Week in a traumatic time. And those parents have been with us really ever since. And they were here this morning. We thank God for uh, the opportunity to walk with this family in the midst of that tragedy. And we're grateful uh, for the flowers dedicated to his life this morning. Uh, as we bring these prayers together, we want to share our concerns. And we say, Say, Lord, hear our prayer for the joys we share those and say, thanks be to God. And let's continue to pray as Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not a temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing one more song.
Indeed, tonight's not the end of the story, and we invite you back next week, same place, same time. We're going to be with Peter again for one more week because he's got more to teach us. If you've been visiting with us today, a very special welcome to you. Glad to have you. Please stay after for coffee and fellowship. On the way out, you'll notice we're selling uh, tickets for the Second Mile Center fundraiser that's happening in just over a month at the Copper Hop Brewery. And also, we've got an Easter backdrop. That's a place for you to take a family photo with your family. You can also sign up for a life group. That's a dinner group happening this week. We want you and your family to be a part of that, to come into other members' homes. Uh, That's this week. Whether you have little kids or big kids or no kids, you're invited to join us for dinner this week. We've been the body of Christ gathered here for worship. Now you're the body of Christ sent out into the world, so let us go with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God now and forevermore. Amen. Sunday.